Good morning and welcome to our pre-budget analysis today. I'm joined with Jeremy Warner, the Associate Editor at The Telegraph, and Katie Morley, our Consumer Affairs Editor. Today is going to be an interesting one. We've got PMQs first, but as we've, we talked about earlier, that's going to become irrelevant pretty quickly. All eyes are going to be on Philip Hammond's budget. And this budget is a particularly interesting budget for political pundits because it's actually about Philip Hammond, the Chancellor himself, and his future. Why do you think so many people are going to be watching Philip and what he delivers today, and why is it politically so significant? Well, this is the second budget uh, this year. Uh, it's widely recognised that he cocked up the first budget with a sort of disastrous announcement on extra national insurance on the self-employed. There are many on the Tory right because Hammond is, of course, a soft Brexiteer. He's not really a Brexiteer at all. He's a Remainer who are just willing him to fail mm. again. So that's going to constrict him very substantially. He will be desperate to avoid anything which can be described as a cock-up or a mistake of any kind. But there's, there are two other reasons why he's completely restricted. He's stitched up like Kipper, effectively. The economy... Uh, and the politics uh, mm -hmm. both count against him. Uh, he's got virtually no room for manoeuvre for giveaways, perhaps a little because he's adjusted the figures a bit and he's done a few stealthy things mm -hmm. which are given a little bit of leeway but not much. And uh, secondly, the politics, you know, uh, this is a hung parliament that's a minority government. There's a limit to how bold he can really be. He can't really do a radical budget. That's no. the that's the politics and the economics of it. Yeah, it feels like we're going to get small, small increments put in. That we know a little bit about what's going to come, but what particularly do you think Philip Hammond's going to talk about? We, we've heard a few small announcements, very small announcements for young people. So rail cards being extended. Last night we got a, an announcement after Number Ten was seemingly disappointed with the lack of you know, oof, in the run-up to the budget about investing in schools. What else do you think we are going to hear from Philip Hammond? Well, as you said, I'm not entirely sure we're going to hear that much. I think young people have been hoping um, really for a killer budget that was really going to give mm -hmm. them um, some real goodies that could make them feel good about, um, you know, what the Conservatives were doing for the economy and for them, their place in the economy. Um, but actually, from the trails that we've seen, um, the rail card, again, something that I think National Rail was planning anyway, um, and possibly something on stamp duty, which may be very helpful for those who are nearly in a position yeah. to buy a house anyway. But for those who are firmly in generation rent, uh, nowhere near buying their own home anyway, not really yeah. uh, that great. So uh, yeah, nothing, I, I don't think we're going to see a killer budget that, that young people really wanted to see, unfortunately. Yeah. I think house building's been a really interesting point of sort of a difficult point around the cabinet table. Sajid Javid, the community secretary, came out last week and was making some very bold statements about the sort of things that we might hope to see in the budget on house building. But then mm. Philip Hammond came out and said, there's no silver bullet for dealing with this. Well, that's what I was referring to, actually. You know, when I yeah. heard, you know, that was quite inspiring, wasn't it? What he said, you know, about the young people and we will look after them and we mm. will ensure that this, you know, major, major housing problem in the UK is solved. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're going to need to build a lot of houses to, to really deal with that. So I do wonder what we will see there. Yeah. And there was a tension between, I think, Theresa May as well and Tory MPs. It feels to me as though Philip Hammond's been put in a bit of a corner as well, because with things like, you know, making the Greenbelt land more yes. easily able to, for housing, housing development companies to build on, lots of the Shire Tory MPs have resisted that. Lots of Tory MPs have resisted sort of changes to, to duty on diesel. And also lots of Tory MPs have resisted changes to VAT on small businesses. So it's quite hard for him to know where to turn. It's the same thing. The politics and the economics uh, confine him and constrict him uh, really substantially. Yeah. I mean, he probably would have liked to have done something uh, bold and ambitious and radical. I mean, let's face it, housing beyond Brexit is yeah. the big issue of our We're times. We're just going to go now because Theresa May has just kicked off PMQs, but we will be back after the Chancellor's budget. Thangham Debonair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the BBC are currently broadcasting Drugsland, a documentary series shot in my constituency of Bristol West, showing the catastrophic impact of drugs and drug laws, not just on users, but on the police and innocent bystanders. So will the Prime Minister commit to watching Drugsland and to a Royal Commission on our drug laws, which are plainly failing? Yeah. 
I am pleased to say that uh, the Home Office, under my right honourable friend the Home Secretary, launched the Government's drug strategy uh, only a matter of weeks ago. Uh, it is, this is, we recognise the importance of this issue. Drugs significantly affect people's lives, and sadly, we also see people dying as a result of, of drugs, taking drugs, but also the criminal activity that takes place around drugs. We take this very seriously. That is why we have launched our strategy. And Nigel Huddleston. Yeah. Divorce and family breakdown <coughs> takes an emotional toll on all those involved, but the family dynamic often overlooked is that between grandparents and their grandchildren. If access to their grandchildren is removed or blocked, uh, some grandparents call this a form of living bereavement. Will the Prime Minister therefore join me, Dame Esther Anson, and thousands of grandparents across the country in calling for a change in the law to give grandparents access rights to their grandchildren, as is the case in France? Yeah. Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right that, of course, grandparents do uh, play an important role in the lives of their grandchildren. We can all, I'm sure, sympathise with those who experience the anguish when they're prevented from seeing their grandchildren uh, if a parental relationship ends. Of course, when making decisions about a child's future, the first consideration must be the child's welfare. But the law already allows family courts to order that a child should spend time with, grand, with their grandparents. And I understand that my honourable friend has recently seen the Minister of State for Justice, and I'm sure that the Ministry of Justice and the Department of Education will consider the points carefully. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the new Usher of the Black Rod, and I'm really pleased it's a woman at last who's got that position. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I hope the whole House, Mr. Speaker, I hope the whole House will join me in sending solidarity following the atrocious suicide bombing which killed 50 people in eastern Nigeria. We should speak with sympathy for those that have, have lost loved ones and the obvious trauma they're all going through. Mr Speaker, the Irish Prime Minister, who has discussed Brexit with the British Government, says sometimes it doesn't seem like they've thought all this through. <laughs> so can the Prime Minister reassure him by clearly outlining the Government's policy on the Irish border? Yeah. I'm glad that the Right Honourable Gentleman has welcomed the new Lady Usher of the Black Rod. Uh, I hope it isn't going to take 650 years before the Labour Party has a female leader. issue that he raised. He referred to the issue of the attack that had taken place in eastern Nigeria, and of course I am sure the thoughts and condolences of the whole House are with those who have been affected by it. Now, he also asked me to outline our policy in relation to the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Well, I am very happy to do so. I have done so on a number of occasions. We are very clear. We are very clear. First of all, that in relation to the movement of people, the common travel area will continue to uh, operate as it has done since 1923. And on trade and movement of goods and services across the border, uh, we will not see uh, a hard border being introduced. We have been very clear. We will not put physical infrastructure at the border. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Foreign Secretary said there can be no border. That would be unthinkable. Well, maybe, but they've had 17 months to come up with an answer to this question, and there still is no answer to the question because they've not engaged with the negotiations properly. There's another person, Mr Speaker, who doesn't think the negotiations are going too well. And that's the right honourable member for Wokingham, no. who was a very enthusiastic campaigner for Brexit, but also is a busy man, finds time also to be the chief global strategist for Charles Stanley Investments. And he recently advised clients to invest elsewhere as the UK is hitting the brakes. Prime Minister take advice from the member for Wokingham, and does she agree with him? The, if I can address the first issue that the Right Honourable Gentleman raised, we have been engaging fully in the negotiations uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and other issues with the negotiations, and indeed significant progress has been made. That is why, for example, I have said 
That's why I've said that we have got agreement on the operation of the common travel area for the future. He says we haven't put any ideas about the border uh, out. Well, I have to say to him, we actually published a paper back in the summer on the possible customs arrangements that could take place. We're, we're very happy. We're very happy to move to further detailed discussions of the customs and trading relationship we will have not just between Northern Ireland and the Republic, but between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Uh, that does mean moving on to phase two. And the question from the right honourable gentleman is if he thinks it's so important, why does his MEPs vote against it? Mr Speaker, the EU's chief negotiator said this week the UK financial sector will lose its current rights in the, to trade with Europe. It seems neither EU negotiators nor the government have any idea where this is going. Yeah. Last week, the Brexit Secretary said he would guarantee free movement for bankers post-Brexit. Are there any other groups to whom the Prime Minister believes freedom of movement should apply? Nurses? Doctors, yeah. teachers, yeah. scientists, agricultural workers, care workers, who? Yeah. I'm, very, I'm very interested that the Right Honourable Gentleman has uh, found that his uh, appearances at Prime Minister's Questions have been going so well, he's had to borrow a question from the leader of the Liberal Democrats, which he asked me, which he, uh, which he asked me last week. Perhaps, perhaps the leader of the opposition should pay a little more attention to what happens in Prime Minister's Questions. We have been absolutely clear that we will be introducing new immigration rules, and as we introduce those immigration rules, we will take account of the needs of the British economy in doing so. That is why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has asked the Migration Advisory Committee to advise, on, as they always do, on those areas where we need to pay particular attention to migration coming into the United Kingdom. Uh, we want to get on to deal with the question of the future trading relationship that we have with the European Union. But we also, I am also optimistic about the opportunities that will be available to this country and about the deal that we can get from the uh, negotiations we're having. The right honourable gentleman can't even decide whether he wants to be in the customs union, out of it, in the single market, out of it. He needs to get his own act together. Well, Mr Speaker, the Brexit Secretary was confident the European Banking Authority would be staying in London. Now he can't even guarantee banks having a right to trade with Europe. Last week, the government voted down, the government voted down Labour's amendments to protect workers' rights. The Foreign Secretary has described employment regulation as, and I quote, backbreaking, and repeatedly promised you, and I quote again, scrap the social chapter. Why won't she guarantee workers' rights, or does she agree with the Foreign Secretary on these matters? We have guaranteed workers' rights. We've introduced introduced a bill in the House of Commons to guarantee workers' rights, and the Labour Party voted against it. Mr Speaker, the record is clear. This Government voted down our amendment to protect workers' rights. The Environment Secretary, the Environment Secretary said he wanted a green Brexit. Yet again, Conservative MPs voted down Labour's amendments to guarantee environmental protection. On the 5th of December, Mr. Speaker, the European Finance Minister's summit takes place to address the issue of tax dodging as exposed by the Paradise Papers. There are three proposals on the table to blacklist tax havens like Bermuda, new transparency rules for tax intermediaries, and mandatory country by country reporting for profit. Will the Prime Minister back these proposals, or is she still threatening to turn Britain into a tax haven? I'll take no lectures from the Labour Party on dealing 
on dealing with tax avoidance and tax evasion. £160 billion more taken as a result of action taken by Conservatives in Government. 75 new measures to deal with tax avoidance and tax evasion. And I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say that recently HMRC won an important case on tax avoidance in the Supreme Court, which means a further £1 billion coming to the United Kingdom. He may talk about tax avoidance and tax evasion. It's this government that takes action and makes sure we collect it. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, her predecessor blocked EU-wide proposals for a public register of trusts. And again, the Conservative MPs have voted down Labour's amendments to deal with tax avoidance. Mr Speaker, when it comes to Brexit, this government is a shambles. Too many members are gesticulating on both sides of the House in a frenetic and, frankly, outlandish <laughs> fashion. Oh, I say to the honourable gentleman member of Helian and Yah, he should, oh, duh, he should seek to imitate the Zen-like calm and statesmanship of the father of the House, <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> I have, mu- I have much in, I have much in common with Zen, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, 17 months. Uh, I understand, Mr Speaker, the Tory whips are these days choreographing who to shout at who in the chamber. You're making a very bad job of it. Mr Speaker, 17 months after the referendum, they say there can be no hard border but haven't worked out how. They say they'll protect workers' rights, then vote against it. They say they'll protect environmental rights, then vote against it. They promise action on tax avoidance, but vote against it time and time again. And, Mr Speaker, once again the Foreign Secretary offers his, his opinions, as does the Environment Secretary, saying there is insufficient energy going into these Brexit negotiations. You said it. You said it. Their words, Mr Speaker, not mine. Isn't the truth this government has no energy, no agreed plan and no strategy to deliver a good Brexit for Britain? Yeah. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he talks about voting against tax avoidance measures. It was the Labour Party that refused to allow tax avoidance measures to go through in a bill before we call the general election. So he should look at his own record, and he talks talks about people taking different opinions. I might remind him that on Monday in the bill, uh, perhaps the Shadow Chancellor would like to listen to this. On Monday, when we were putting through that important piece of legislation in relation to customs and taxation in Europe, 76 Labour MPs voted in a different lobby from his and his. The party in this Commons that has no clue on Brexit is the Labour Party. But week in and week out, the right honourable gentleman, week in and week out, the right honourable gentleman comes to this House and talks down our country and is pessimistic about our future. Well, let me tell him, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about our future. I'm optimistic about the success we can make of Brexit. I'm optimistic about the well-paid jobs that will be created. I'm optimistic about the homes we will build. That's Conservatives building a Britain fit for the future. All all he offers is a blast from the past. Assure people that this Conservative government is committed to maintaining the United Kingdom's strong commitment to the highest standards of animal welfare, both now and post Brexit. Well, I'm very happy. 
happy to give my honourable friend that commitment. We already, as you and others will know, have some of the highest animal welfare standards in the world. And as we leave the EU, we should not only maintain but enhance those standards. Um, we've already set out our proposals to introduce mandatory CCTV in slaughterhouses, increase sentences for animal cruelty to five years, ban microbeads which damage marine life, and ban the ivory trade to help bring an end to elephant poaching. And we also recognise and respect that animals are sentient beings and should be treated accordingly. The Animal, Welf the animal Welfare Act 2006 provides protection for all animals capable of experiencing pain or suffering which are under the control of man. But I reaffirmed my honourable friend that we will be ensuring that we maintain and enhance our animal welfare standards when we leave the EU. In Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister tell the House how many jobs have been lost this week with the departure of the European Medicines Authority and the European Banking Authority from London? Gentlemen, but of course we are seeing those particular two agencies leave the United Kingdom and go elsewhere in the European Union. But when he talks about the number of jobs being created, we have seen under this government three million jobs being created. That's a record I would have thought even he would be willing to welcome. And Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But of course the Prime Minister refused to answer the question. Let me tell her, just as so she is aware of the cost of the hard Tory Brexit. Losing the EMA and the EBA means that losing over 1,000 jobs. And the Bank of England have told us that the city will lose 75,000 jobs. Jobs are already gone. Jobs are going. Brexit is already biting. Will the Prime Minister recognise that exiting the EU is losing jobs and sector excellence from the United Kingdom? I recognise, as I said, that those two particular agencies are leaving uh, the United Kingdom. But the right honourable gentleman talks about numbers of jobs being lost. I repeat, since the Conservatives came into government, three million jobs have been created. That's three million more people in work. That's three million more people able to provide an income for themselves and their families. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last year, housing associations generated £5.5 billion in cash surplus, money that could be used to build 48,000 new homes in this country. The accumulated uh, reserves that housing associations have come to £42 billion, which would mean 36,500 properties a year for the next 10 years could be built. Will my right honourable friend look at ways? that we can make sure that housing associations use the money to build the new homes that people want, rather than having them sitting in the bank. My hon. Friend, friend does raise an important point, and of course this whole issue of housing, and particularly homelessness, is something that he has uh, been a campaigner on and campaigned strongly on. But this is, in fact, already the approach that is taken by housing associations. They are non-profit organisations, so their surpluses are reinvested in the business, often in the next year. And In fact, for example, in 2015-16, their investment in new and existing properties was more than double the surpluses that they uh, that they generated. Now, I have recently announced an additional £2 billion funding for, homes, for affordable homes, including for social rent. Last week, housing associations were reclassified to the private sector. That takes £70 billion of debt off the country's balance sheet, which means greater certainty for housing associations to get on with the job that my honourable friend and I both want them to do, which is building more homes. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Blackman. Yeah. Much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my thoughts are with my many constituents who have got friends and family in Nigeria at this time. Um, Mr. Speaker, the SNP has asked 140 <laughs> times for the VAT paid by our police and fire, ser fire services to be scrapped and for the £140 million pounds to be refunded. Mr. Speaker, the Chancellor said only last month that legally we would not be able to recover VAT and that the UK government is now constrained by the VAT rules that are in place. Was he misleading us? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the SNP may have answered a number of questions, but of course the SNP knew when they took the decision to create a single police and fire authority that this would be the VAT treatment. Peter Hurst. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Speaker, given the revised housing proposals that will force unprecedented numbers to the equivalent of a new town in what is left of Medway's Green Belt, will the Prime Minister give me and my constituents the assurances and the necessary large scale investment which will, uh, which will need to be made to boost public service infrastructure, which will have to cope with up to 100,000 more people? This is, this is, of course, an important point for uh, people not just in my honourable friend's constituency uh, but elsewhere. We do want to see more homes being built because I want young people to have the prospect that they are going to have the future that their parents and grandparents uh, were able to have to own, owning their own homes. So we are going to go further in building more homes, but she's absolutely right that, of course, as we do that, we need to make sure the infrastructure is in place. We are putting in billions from central government for economic infrastructure every year up to 2021. That includes issues like transport projects, fibre broad, connections, but we recognise the importance of making sure the homes are supported by the right infrastructure. Jim Ryan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am proud that the last Labour government lifted more than one million children out of poverty. This government seems committed to doing the very opposite. With the Institute of Fiscal Studies, with the Institute of Fiscal Studies predicting that an additional 1.2 million children will be pushed into poverty by 2021, and that's on top of the 4 million in 2015-16, is the Prime Minister proud of her government's record of failure on this, and does she think this worrying forecast is acceptable? I have to say to the Honourable Lady that far from the way in which she has portrayed the situation, we have seen since 2010 600,000 fewer people in absolute poverty. That's a record low. 300,000 fewer working age adults in absolute poverty. And 200,000 children, uh, fewer children in absolute poverty. 200,000 fewer children in absolute poverty. What we've also seen, what we've also seen, is families getting into work. Nearly uh, uh, one million fewer workless households as a result of the actions of this Conservative government. Kirsten Hare. is aware Scotland is lagging behind the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of super-fast broadband rollout, with my constituency of Angus even further behind that poor Scottish average. A huge volume of my casework from one of my... A huge volume of my casework from one of my largest towns of our growth, where 20,000 of my constituents reside. It is hardly what you would deem a remote area. Can the Prime Minister confirm that the next generation of UK funding to support the rollout of Scotland's full fibre broadband will bypass that shambolic Scottish yeah. government? I'm very happy to confirm that to my honourable friend. She, she will know that we are making progress in Scotland in this, but we do need to go further. So programmes like local full fibre networks and 5G will allocate funding directly to local projects based on the quality of the bids put forward. And my honourable friend, the Minister for Digital, has recently confirmed in the House that for the next generation of technology, we will deliver it directly to local authorities in Scotland than going through the Scottish Government because we want to make sure we will make sure that Scotland is not left behind. Yasmin Qureshi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2014, an inquiry was set up to look into the drug Primados given to millions of pregnant women in the 60s and 70s which caused deformities and documents showing a clear cover-up. Last week, a report was published which was condemned by MPs across the House as being whitewash and misleading. Will the Prime Minister meet the victims and order a public inquiry so justice can finally be done for these people? You know, this is an issue that a number of members have been concerned about, and I recognise that the result of that review was not what some members and families were hoping for. It was a comprehensive, independent scientific review of the available evidence by experts 
all the meetings of the expert working group were attended by Nick Dobrik as an invited independent expert from the Thalidomai Trust and at the request of the patient group, ACDHPT. And, uh, the overall conclusion, I'm informed, is that the scientific evidence does not support a causal association, but that doesn't detract from the very real suffering that has been experienced by the families. And I recognise that these conclusions are hard to accept, but the Department of Health is focused on implementing the review's recommendations, which will strengthen detection and better communicate the risk of medicines during pregnancy. Even Hammond. Mr. Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the right revised offer to the EU, far from throwing money away, will be worthwhile to secure the UK's future trade relationship with our European neighbours? As uh, I say to my honourable friend, he does raise an important issue. I set out in my speech in Florence that the UK will honour the commitments that we've made during our period of membership. We don't want our European partners to fear that they will have to receive less or pay in more during the current budget plan as a result of our leaving the European Union. But we can only resolve the financial implications of the UK's withdrawal uh, finally as part of the settlement of all the issues that I spoke about in Florence. Uh, but once that is done, of course, the days of Britain paying vast sums of money to the EU every year will end. Peter Kyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every Prime Minister since 1946 has successfully appointed a British judge to the International Court of Justice. Why hasn't she? Can I I actually say to the Honourable Gentleman that the British Prime Minister does not appoint judges to the International Court of Justice. There is a process that is undertaken in the United Nations. We wish wish all the judges who have been appointed by the votes through the United Nations to the International Court of Justice well. Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My right honourable friend might be aware that in a Westminster Hall debate last week, members of the Scottish National Party declared that if the Scottish Government did not agree with the final Brexit deal, they would push for another independence referendum. This, this, this obsession with breaking up our United Kingdom is damaging the Scottish economy and causing uncertainty. So will she join me today in calling for the SNP to drop? once and for all, their obsession with a second independence referendum. I, the point that my honourable friend raises is a very important one. Scotland had a referendum in 2014. That referendum was legal and fair, and the result was decisive. The people of Scotland voted clearly to remain part of the United Kingdom. And, uh, and I think at the election they sent a second message that they didn't want a second referendum on this issue. So I say to the Scottish Government, as we, as we prepare to leave the EU, we should be, they should be working with us, with the UK Government, to get the right deal for the whole of the UK, not taking Scotland back to these divisive constitutional uh, debates of the past. And so I agree with my honourable friend that the SNP should take their unwanted proposal off the table once and for all. Nick Dakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister support steel jobs in Scunthorpe and elsewhere by guaranteeing if the current flexibility within the emissions trading scheme is not retained to March 2019, that she will act immediately to ensure British industry is not financially penalised? The Honourable Gentleman raises an important point about steel, and of course this Government has done a considerable amount over the last few years to support the steel industry here in the United Kingdom. I was very pleased to uh, be able to, earlier in the year, to make a visit and meet with steel workers and talk about the prospects for steel here in the United Kingdom. And we will, of course, look carefully to ensure uh, that the arrangements that are in place are those that are right for in the national interest, and we have supported steel in the past. Sir Crispin Blunt. Thank you, Mr. Crispin. Can I take my right honourable friend back to the uh, first question asked by the honourable lady for Bristol West? And quite apart from commending the uh, quality of the BBC programme that she uh, re- referred to, uh, on the whole issue of prohibition of drugs globally, can I draw her attention to the fact that global policy is beginning to change and that the, in the face of the evidential failure of the policy since the 1961 uh, UN Single Convention on uh, Prohibition of Narcotics Drugs, 
And will she look at the evidence that's going to emerge in the United States and Canada on the legalisation and regulation of cannabis markets there, as well as decriminalisation in Portugal uh, and, and elsewhere? And open Gravamen of the inquiry from the honourable gentleman. We're, we're a little clearer than we were. And we're immensely grateful. No, 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 no. Quite enough. We're very grateful to the honourable gentleman. Prime Minister. Yes, well, I can say to my honourable friend that, of course, when I was Home Secretary, the piece of work was undertaken by the Home Office, which did look at the experience in a number of countries and the different ways in which they approach this, different, this issue of drugs. But I'm afraid I do just have to say to my honourable friend that I take a different opinion from him in relation to, to drugs. And, uh, and I think that those who are dealing with uh, people who have been affected by drugs would also do so. I think of my constituent, Elizabeth Burton Phillips, who set up Drug Fam after after the suicide of her son, who was a drug addict, the work she is doing with families who were affected because a member of the family is on drugs, and the incredible uh, damage that that can do to families and to the individual concerned. I'm sorry I say to my honourable friend, I take a different view. I think it's right that we continue to fight the war against drugs. The Honourable Member for Chesterfield has migrated a considerable distance from his usual place, but we look forward to hearing from him anyway. Toby Perkins. Uh, Mr Speaker, people with the most severe disabilities have discovered that when they move on to universal credit, they're up to £100 a week worse off. This is because there's no severe disability component in the payment. So whatever happens about delays in the next hour, does the Prime Minister realise that universal credit will continue to shame her government whilst ever it pushes the most disabled into the worst poverty? I say to the honourable gentleman that we uh, spend over £50 billion a year on benefits to support disabled people and people with health conditions. That's increased by more than £7 billion since 2010. Uh, and spending on disability benefits will be higher in every year to 2020 than it was in 2010. And as regards universal credit, as I've said in this chamber before, universal credit is a simpler, more straightforward system. But crucially, universal credit is helping people get into the workplace and making sure that they keep the more of the money that they earn. To David Amos! Honourable friend, join me in congratulating the Leon C. branch of the British Legion, local artist Beth Hooper and Mary Lister, on using a lottery grant for school children in South End to make seven and a half thousand ceramic poppies and display them on South End's cliffs. And would she agree with me? It's a further good reason to make South End on Sea a city. <laughs> Well, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in congratulating the Leon C branch of the Royal British Legion in the work that they have done in ensuring that young people actually recognise the importance of remembrance and the sacrifices, recognising the sacrifices that have been made by previous generations for our safety and security. And as to his second point, um, that's a very interesting bid that he's put in. I know South End on Sea is close to his heart and he champions it all the time. And uh, I'm sure his bid will be looked at carefully. Howdy. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister, my constituent Hayley Crawley is having palliative care for bowel cancer and she needs a specialist cancer drug that's available for other cancers. She waited months to hear that her case for funding was rejected by NHS England and we are now waiting again to hear a reply for her appeal. Please will, you write, uh, please will the Prime Minister write to NHS England and ensure that Hayley's case is treated as a priority? Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, I'm aware this will be causing um, distress to Hayley while she is waiting for this, uh, this uh, appeal decision to come through, and I'm sure the Secretary of State for Health will look closely at the case that the Honourable Lady has raised. We have, of course, we were of course able to bring in the Cancer Drugs Fund, which has enabled some uh, can uh, patients to get access to drugs that otherwise would not be available, but I recognise the concern and distress that her constituent will be suffering from while she awaits for this decision. Yeah. The Prime Minister will be aware that under President Mugabe, British citizens living in Zimbabwe, especially landowners, suffered considerably. Can she give an assurance to the House that, as we see a new regime coming into Z in to Zimbabwe, the British Government will do all it can to persuade the new regime to treat 
British citizens living lawfully in that country treat them with respect and the safety and security that they should have, along with all other Zimbabwean citizens. Yeah. Yes. Well, my, my honourable friend does raise an important point as we see this uh, change taking place in Zimbabwe. And I have to say that the resignation of Robert Mugabe, I think, provides Zimbabwe with an opportunity to forge a new path free from the oppression that has characterised the past. We want to see a democratic, free, secure Zimbabwe, where people across communities, from communities across Zimbabwe, are able to carry out their lives without fear, without oppression. Uh, and we want to see that country rejoining the international community. Uh, we uh, have obviously uh, provided some support uh, to uh, Zimbabwe in terms of UK aid. And as their oldest friend, we will do everything we can to support their change into a country that is free, that is democratic, that is free of all uh, oppression for all communities. Order. <laughs> Presentation of Bill Geraint Davis. Clean Air Bill. Second reading, what day? Friday, the 1st of December 2017, Mr. Speaker. Friday, the 1st of December 2017. Thank you. Order. 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 Before I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I remind honourable members that copies of the budget resolutions will be available in the vote office at the end of the Chancellor's speech. I also remind honourable members that it is not the norm to intervene on the Chancellor of the Exchequer or the Leader of the Opposition. I now call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Right Honourable Philip Hammond. Mr Deputy Speaker, I report today on an economy that continues to grow, continues to create more jobs than ever before, and continues to confound those who seek to talk it down. An economy set on a path to a new relationship with our European neighbours and a new future outside the European Union. A future that will be full of change, full of new challenges and, above all, full of new opportunities. And in this Budget, we express our resolve to look forwards, not backwards, to embrace that change, to meet those challenges head on and to seize those opportunities for Britain. The negotiations on our future relationship with the EU are in a critical phase. My right hon. Friend the Prime Minister has been clear that we seek a deep and special partnership based on free and frictionless trading goods and services, close collaboration on security and strong mutual respect and friendship. And as Chancellor, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am clear that one of the biggest boosts we can provide to businesses and families, one of the best ways to protect British jobs and prosperities as we build that new future, is to make early progress in delivering my right hon. Friend's vision. With an implementation agreement that allows businesses to plan and invest with confidence. And this Government will make the pursuit of that progress a top priority in the weeks ahead. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, while we work to achieve this deep and special partnership, we are determined to ensure that the country is prepared for every possible outcome. We have already invested almost £700 million in Brexit preparations, and today I am setting aside over the next two years another £3 billion, and I stand ready to allocate further sums if and when needed. Mr Deputy Speaker, no one should doubt our resolve. But this Budget is about much more than Brexit. The world is on the brink of a technological revolution, one that will change the way we work and live and transform our living standards for generations to come. And we face a choice. Either we embrace the future, seize the opportunities which lie within our grasp and build on Britain's great global success story, or, as the party opposite advocates, reject change and turn inwards to the failed and irrelevant dogmas of the past. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have no doubts. We choose the future. We choose, we choose, we choose, 
We choose to run towards change, not away from it, to prepare our people to meet the challenges ahead, not to hide from them. And the prize will be enormous, because for the first time in decades, Britain is genuinely at the forefront of this technological revolution, not just in our universities and research institutes, but this time in the commercial development labs of our great companies and on factory floors and business parks across this land. But we must invest to secure that bright future for Britain, and at this budget, that is what we choose to do. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are listening and we understand the frustration of families where real incomes are under pressure. So at this budget, we choose a balanced approach. Yes, maintaining fiscal responsibility as we at last see our debt peaking. Continuing to invest in the skills and infrastructure that will support the jobs of the future. Building the homes that will make good on our promise to the next generation. But crucially, also helping families to cope with the cost of living. Yeah, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, as we invest in our country's future, I have a clear vision of what that global Britain looks like. A prosperous and inclusive economy, yeah, yeah, yeah. where everybody has the opportunity to shine, wherever in these islands they live and whatever their background where talent and hard work are rewarded, where the dream of home ownership is a reality for all generations, a hub of enterprise and innovation, a beacon of creativity, a civilised and tolerant place that cares for the vulnerable and nurtures the talented, an outward-looking, free-trading nation, a force for good in the world. That is the Britain that I want to leave to my children, Mr Deputy Speaker, a Britain we can be proud of, a country fit for the future. I know we will not build it overnight, but in this budget today we will lay the foundations. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm being tempted with something uh, a little more exotic here, but I'm going to stick to plain water. But I. I, I, did, I did take the precaution. I did take the precaution of asking my right honourable friend to bring a packet of cough sweets just in case. <laughs> Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I shall Oh, order, order. I, order, oh, oh. order. I think it might be a hearing aid we all need if this continues. <laughs> Just the extra. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, I shall first report to the House on the economic forecasts of the independent OBR. This is the bit with the long economic -y words in it. <laughs> Once Once again, I, I thank Robert Choate and his team for their hard work over the last few weeks. Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe passionately that the best way to improve the lives of people across the length and breadth of this country is to help them get into work. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I am acutely aware that 1.4 million people out of work is 1.4 million too many. So today, so today, I welcome the OBR forecast that there will be another 600,000 people in work by 2022. And I am immensely proud of this government's record in having created over 3 million new jobs since 2010. Incidentally, a rather far cry from the 1.2 million job losses that the Right Honourable Member for Hayes and Harlington predicted in 2011. But let nobody be in any doubt that this Government will continue its relentless focus on getting more people into work, giving them the security and peace of mind of a regular wage. But I also want work to be a good quality, well-paid 
and regrettably our productivity performance continues to disappoint. The OBR has assumed at each of the last 16 fiscal events that productivity growth would return to its pre-crisis trend of about 2 per cent a year, but it has remained stubbornly flat. So today they revised down the outlook for productivity growth, business investment and GDP growth across the forecast period. The OBR now expects to see GDP grow 1.5% in 2017, 1.4% in 2018, 1.3% in 2019 and 2020, before picking back up to 1.5% and finally 1.6% in 2022, with inflation peaking at 3% in this quarter before falling back towards target over the next year. And today I reaffirm the remit for the Independent Monetary Policy Committee and its 2% CPI inflation target. Mr Deputy Speaker, we took over an economy with the highest budget deficit in our peacetime history. Since then, since then, thanks to the hard work of the British people, that deficit has been shrinking. And next year, and next year will be below 2%. But our debt is still too high and we need to get it down. Not for some ideological reason, but because excessive debt undermines our economic security, leaving us vulnerable to shocks, because it passes the burden unfairly to the next generation, and because it simply cannot be right to spend more on our debt interest than we do on our police and our armed forces combined. So I am pleased to be able to tell the House that OBR expects debt to peak this year and then gradually fall as a share of GDP a turning point in our recovery from Labour's crisis. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, apparently not everyone shares the view that falling debt is good news. I have heard representations from the party opposite suggesting increasing the debt by £500 billion, taking us back to square one wasting an extra £7 billion a year on debt interest. Mr Speaker, if they carry on like that, there will be plenty of others joining Keisha Dugdale in saying, I'm Labour, get me out of here. <laughs> Mr. Deputy, Mr Deputy Speaker, it must be. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have rejected these representations and instead I reaffirm our pledge of fiscal responsibility and our commitment to the fiscal rules I set out last autumn. But now I choose to use some of the headroom I established then so that, as well as reducing debt, we can also invest in Britain's future, support our key public services, keep taxes low and provide a little help to families and businesses under pressure. A balanced approach that will prepare Britain for the future, not seek to hide from it. Today the OBR confirm that we are on track to meet our fiscal rules. Borrowing is forecast to be £49.9 billion this year. That is £8.4 billion lower than forecast at the spring budget. And after taking account of all decisions since the spring budget, the OPR's GDP revision and the measures I will announce today, borrowing will fall in every year of the forecast, from £39.5 billion next year to £25.6 billion in 2022-23, to reach its lowest level in 20 years. As a percentage of our GDP, it falls from 2.4 per cent this year to 1.9 per cent next year, then 1.6, 1.5, 1.3 and finally 1.1 per cent in 2022-23. The OBR forecasts the structural deficit to be 1.3 per cent of GDP in 2021, giving £14.8 billion of headroom against our 2 per cent target. Debt will peak at 86.5 per cent of GDP this year. It will then fall to 86.4 per cent next year, then 86.1, 83.1, 79.3 and finally 79.1 in 2022-23 the first sustained decline in debt in 17 years. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, under Conservative-led governments, the hard work of the British people is steadily clearing up the mess left behind by Labour. Mr Deputy Speaker, at the heart of global Britain must be a dynamic and innovative economy. On Monday, the Prime Minister set out the key elements of our modern industrial strategy, a strategy to raise productivity and wages in all parts of our country and to guarantee the brighter future we have promised to the next generation. My right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, will present a white paper to the House in the next few days. But this is not just an economic plan. It is a key part of our vision for a fairer Britain, a Britain where every one of our citizens can contribute to and share in the benefits of prosperity. And the key to raising the wages of British workers is raising investment, public and private. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are investing in Britain's future, half a trillion pounds since 2010 the biggest rail programme since Victorian times, the largest road building programme since the 1970s, the biggest increase in science and innovation funding in four decades, and the two largest infrastructure projects in Europe, Crossrail and HS2. When I took this job, I committed to make the battle to raise Britain's productivity, and thus the nation's pay, the central mission of the Treasury. Last autumn, I launched the National Productivity Investment Fund to provide an additional £23 billion of investment over five years to upgrade Britain's economic infrastructure for the 21st century. Today I can announce that I will extend this fund for a further year and expand it to over £31 billion. Meaning, Mr Deputy Speaker, that public investment under this government will, on average, be £25 billion per year higher in real terms than under the last Labour government. We are allocating a further £2.3 billion for investment in R&D, and we will increase the main R&D tax credit to 12 per cent, taking the first strides towards the ambition of the industrial strategy to drive up R&D investment across the economy to 2.4 per cent of GDP. Mr Deputy Speaker, Britain is the world's sixth largest economy. London is the number one international financial services centre. We have some of the world's best companies and a commanding position in a raft of tech and digital industries that will form the backbone of the global economy of the future. Those who underestimate Britain do so at their peril. Because because we will harness this this potential and turn it into the high-paid, high-productivity jobs of tomorrow. Others may choose to reject the future. We choose to embrace it. A new tech business is founded in Britain every hour, and I want that to be every half hour. So today, we invest over £500 million in a range of initiatives, from artificial intelligence to 5G and full fibre broadband, We support regulatory innovation with a new Regulators Pioneer Fund and a new Geospatial Data Commission to develop develop a strategy for using the government's location data to support economic growth. And to help our tech startups reach scale, we asked Sir Damon Buffini to review the availability of patient capital, and I'm very grateful to him. Today we're publishing an action plan to unlock over £20 billion of new investment in UK knowledge-intensive scale-up businesses, including through a new fund in the British Business Bank, seeded with £2.5 billion of public money, by facilitating pension fund access to long-term investments, and by doubling EIS investment limits for knowledge-intensive companies while ensuring that EIS is not used as a shelter for low-risk capital preservation schemes. And we stand ready to step in to replace European investment fund lending if necessary. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is perhaps no technology as symbolic of the revolution gathering pace around us as driverless vehicles. (laughs) 
They surely don't want me to make that joke about the Labour Party again, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I know that Jeremy Clarkson doesn't like them, but there are many other good reasons to pursue this technology. <laughs> so today we step up our support for it. Sorry, Jeremy, but definitely not the first time you've been snubbed by Hammond and May. Yeah. <laughs> our, future vehicles, our future vehicles will be driverless. Our future vehicles will be driverless, but they will be electric first, and that is a change that needs to come as soon as possible for our planet. So we will establish a new £400 million charging infrastructure fund, invest an extra £100 million in plug-in car grant and £40 million in charging R&D. And I can confirm today that we will clarify the law so that people who charge their electric vehicles at work will not face a benefit-in-kind charge from next year. The tax system can play an important role in protecting our environment. We owe it to our children that the air they breathe is clean. We published our air quality plan earlier this year, and we said then that we would fund it through taxes on new diesel cars. From April 2018, the first-year VED rate for diesel cars that don't mean the latest, meet the latest standards will go up by one band, and the existing diesel supplement in company car tax will increase by one percentage point. Drivers buying a new car will be able to avoid this charge as soon as manufacturers bring forward the next generation cleaner diesels that we all want to see. And we only apply this measure to cars. So before the headline writers start limbering up, let me be quite clear. No white van man, no white van woman, woman will be hit by these measures. This levy, this levy will fund a new... This levy will fund a new £220 million clean air fund to provide support for the implementation of local air quality plans, improving of the quality of the air in cities and towns up and down the UK. But our air quality is sadly not our only environmental challenge. Audiences across the country, glued to Blue Planet 2, have been starkly reminded of the problems of plastics pollution. The UK led the world on climate change agreements and is a pioneer in protecting marine environments. And I want us now to become a world leader in tackling the scourge of plastic littering our planet and our oceans. So, with my right honourable friend, the Environment Secretary, I will investigate how the tax system and charges on single use plastic items can reduce waste. Because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we cannot keep our promise to the next generation to build an economy fit for the future unless we ensure our planet has a future. Yeah. Mr. Deputy Speaker, meeting the challenge of change head on means giving our people the confidence to embrace it and the skills to reap the rewards from it, and we have a plan to do so. We are delivering three million apprenticeship starts by 2020, thanks to our apprenticeship levy, and I will keep under review the flexibility that levy payers have to spend this money. We are introducing T levels, and today I provide a further £20 million to support FE colleges to prepare for them. Mr Deputy Speaker, knowledge of maths is key to the high-tech cutting-edge jobs in our digital economy. It is also useful, by the way, in less glamorous roles like frontline politics. <laughs> so we will expand the Teaching for Mastery of Maths programme to a further 3,000 schools. We will provide £40 million to train maths teachers across the country. We will introduce a £600 maths premium for schools for every additional pupil who takes A-level core and core a-level or core maths, and will invite proposals for new maths schools across England so highly talented young mathematicians can release their potential wherever they live and whatever their background. Yeah. More maths for everyone. Mr Speaker, don't let anyone say, I don't know how to show the nation a good time. <laughs> Computer science, computer science is also at the heart of this revolution. 
so we'll ensure that every secondary school pupil can study computing by tripling the number of trained computer science teachers, teachers to 12,000. And we'll work with industry to create a, create a new national centre for computing. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, rapid technological change means we also need to help people to retrain during their working lives, yeah. ensuring that our workforce is equipped with the skills they need for the workplace of the future. So today, my right hon. Friend, the Education Secretary, and I are launching an historic partnership between Government, the CBI and the TUC to set the strategic direction for a national retraining scheme. Its first priority will be to boost digital skills and to support expansion of the construction sector. And to make a start immediately, we will invest £30 million in the development of digital skills distance learning courses so people can learn wherever they are and whenever they want. And I'm pleased to be able to accept the representation that I've received from the TUC to continue to fund Union Learn, which I recognise as a valuable part of our support to workplace learning. Mr Deputy Speaker. Apparently they don't, they don't Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, backing skills. I got an email from Len asking me specially, so I couldn't say no. Backing skills is key to unlocking growth nationally, but far too much of our economic strength is concentrated in our capital city. If we are truly to build an economy that is fit for the future, then we have to get all parts of the UK firing on all cylinders. And that, that is what our modern industrial strategy is all about. Today, we back the Northern Powerhouse, the Midlands Engine and elected mayors across the UK. We back them with a new £1.7 billion Transforming Cities Fund, half of it to be shared by the six areas with elected metro mayors to give them the firepower to deliver on local transport priorities, and the remainder will be open to competition by other cities in England. We are investing £300 million to ensure that HS2 infrastructure will accommodate future Northern Powerhouse and Midland Engine rail improvements. I am also providing £30 million today to trial new solutions to improve mobile and digital connectivity on trains on the Trans Pennine route. We are developing a local industrial strategy with Manchester, and I am pleased to announce a second devolution deal with Andy Street in the West Midlands. We have agreed a new devolution deal with North of the Tyne, and we will fund the replacement of the 40-year-old rolling stock on the Tyne and Weir Metro at a total investment of £337 million. We will invest £123 million in the Redcar Steelworks site to support the ambitious plans of our new Tees Valley Mayor, Ben Houchen, and my honourable friend from Middlesbrough South and East Cleveland, who are leading the fight for prosperity in their area. And Mr Deputy Speaker, we are piloting 100 per cent business rates retention in London next year and continuing to work with TfL on the funding and financing of Crossrail 2. We will also make over £1 billion of discounted lending available to local authorities across the country to support high-value infrastructure projects. A Conservative government giving power back to the people of Britain and driving prosperity and greater fairness across our United Kingdom. Mr Deputy Speaker, the decisions taken in this budget also mean £2 billion more for the Scottish Government, £1.2 billion more for the Welsh Government, and over £650 million more for a Northern Ireland executive. I can confirm today that progress is being made on city deals for Tay Cities and Stirling and on a growth deal for Borderlands. I am getting used, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the experience of having my ear bent by 13 Scottish Conservative colleagues. Most recently on the issue of Scottish Police and Fire VAT. The SNP knew the rules, they knew the consequences of introducing these bodies, and they ploughed ahead anyway. But Mr Deputy Speaker, my Scottish Conservative colleagues have persuaded me 
persuaded me that the Scottish people should not lose out just because of the obstinacy of the SNP government. So we will legislate to allow VAT refunds from April 2018. And in response to yet more representations from my honourable Scottish friends, aided and abetted by my honourable friend for Waveney, from November 2018, we will introduce transferable tax history for transfers of oil and gas fields in the North Sea, an innovative tax policy that will encourage new entrants to bring fresh investment to a basin that still holds up to 20 billion barrels of oil. We will begin negotiations towards growth deals for North Wales and Mid Wales, and we will abolish tolls on the Severn Bridge as promised by the end of next year. We will deliver on our commitment to review the effect of VAT and APD on tourism in Northern Ireland, reporting at next year's budget, and we will open negotiations for a Belfast city deal as part of our commitment to a comprehensive and ambitious set of city deals across Northern Ireland, a Conservative government delivering for all parts of our United Kingdom. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is only by supporting our regions and nations, dealing with our debts and investing in skills and infrastructure for the long term that we can build an economy fit for the future. But I recognise that many people are feeling pressure on their budgets now. And because we are all in politics to make people's lives better, in the short term as well as the long term, we will take further measures in this budget to help families and businesses where we can. Mr Deputy Speaker, the switch to universal credit is a long overdue and necessary reform. Replacing Labour's broken system that discouraged people from working more than 16 hours a week and trapped 1.4 million on out-of-work benefits for nearly a decade, universal credit delivers a modern welfare system where work always pays and people are supported to earn. But I recognise, Mr Deputy Speaker, the genuine concerns on both sides of the House about the operational delivery of this benefit, and today we will act on those concerns. First, we will remove the seven-day waiting period applied at the beginning of a benefit claim so that entitlement to universal credit will start on the day of the claim. To provide greater support during the waiting period, we will change the advances system to ensure that any household that needs it can access a full month's payment within five days of applying. We will, we will make it possible to apply for an advance online. We will extend the repayment period for advances from six months to 12 months. And any new universal credit claimant in receipt of housing benefit at the time of the claim will continue to receive that housing benefit for a further two weeks, making it easier for them to pay their rent. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a £1.5 billion package to address concerns about the delivery of the benefit. My, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, will give further details in a statement to the House tomorrow. Mr Deputy Speaker, we also want to help low-income households in areas where rents have been rising fastest. In the long run, of course, the answer lies in increasing the amount of housing available, a theme I shall return to. But in the meantime, the best way to help them is by increasing the rate of support in those areas where rents are least affordable. So we will increase targeted affordability funding by £125 million over the next two years benefiting 140,000 people. We will always listen to genuine concerns and act where we can to help. Mr Deputy Speaker, making work pay is core to the philosophy of this Government. That is why we introduced the National Living Wage in 2016. From April, it will rise by 4.4 per cent from £7.50 an hour to £7.83, handing full-time workers a further £600 pay increase, taking their total pay rise since its introduction to over £2,000 a year. We also accept the Low Pay Commission's recommendations on national minimum wage rates, 
supporting our young people with the largest increase in youth rates in 10 years, delivering a pay rise for over 2 million minimum wage workers of all ages across the country. Mr Deputy Speaker, the facts are these. Income inequality today is at its lowest level in 30 years. The top 1% are paying a larger share of income tax than at any time under the last Labour government. The poorest 10% in Britain have seen their real incomes grow faster since 2010 than the richest 10%. And the proportion of full-time jobs that are low-paid is at its lowest level for 20 years. A Conservative government delivering a fairer Britain. But as well as making work pay, we want families to keep more of the money they earn. When we came into office, the personal allowance stood at £6,475 a year. From April, I will increase the personal allowance to £11,850 and the higher rate threshold to £46,350, making progress towards our manifesto commitments, which I reiterate today. The typical basic rate taxpayer will be £1,075 a year better off compared to 2010, and a full-time worker on the national living wage will take home more than £3,800 extra. This Conservative government delivering for Britain's workers. Mr Deputy Speaker, I turn now to duties. The tobacco duty escalator will continue at inflation plus 2% with an additional 1% duty on hand-rolling tobacco this year, and minimum excise duty on cigarettes will also rise. Excessive alcohol consumption by the most vulnerable people is all too often through cheap, high-strength, low-quality products, especially so-called white ciders. I want to pay tribute to the campaign led by my hon. Friend for Congleton on this issue, and so following our recent consultation, we will legislate to increase duty on these products from 2019. But recognising the pressure on household budgets and backing our great British pubs, duties on other ciders, wines, spirits and on beer will be frozen. This will mean a bottle of whisky will be £1.15 less in 2018 than if we had continued with Labour's plans, and a pint of beer, 12p less. So Merry Christmas, Mr Deputy Speaker. <laughs> the cost of travel is also an important factor for families and businesses. From April 2019, I will again freeze short-haul air passenger duty rates, and I will also freeze long-haul economy rates, paid for by an increase on premium class tickets, and on private jets. Sorry, Lewis. For those who don't stretch to a private jet, I can announce a new rail card for those aged 26 to 30, giving 4.5 million more young people a third off their rail fares. And I will, and I will Mr Deputy Speaker, once again cancel the fuel duty rise for both petrol and diesel that is scheduled for April. Since 2010, we will have saved the average car driver £850 and the average van driver over £2,100 compared to Labour's escalator plans. Fuel duty has now been frozen for the longest period in 40 years at a total cost to the Exchequer of £46 billion since 2010. Mr Deputy Speaker, our NHS is one of our great institutions, yeah, yeah, yeah. an essential part of what we are as a nation, and a source of pride, the length and breadth of the country. Its values are the values of the British people, and we will always back it. Dedicated NHS staff are handling the challenges of an ageing population and a rapidly advancing technology with skill and commitment, and we salute them. Mr Deputy Speaker, although you wouldn't think so to listen to the Leader of the Opposition as he regularly talks down the achievements of the NHS, although you wouldn't think so, 
The number of patients being treated is at record levels. Cancer survival rates are at their highest ever level. 17 million people are now able to access GP appointments in the evenings and at weekends. And public satisfaction amongst hospital inpatients is at its highest level in more than 20 years. It is central to this Government's vision that everyone has access to the NHS free at the point of need. That is why we endorsed and funded the NHS's five-year forward view in 2014. But even with this additional funding, we acknowledge that the service remains under pressure, and today we respond. First, we will deliver an additional £10 billion package of capital investment in frontline services over the course of this Parliament to support the sustainability and transformation plans which will make our NHS more resilient investing for an NHS fit for the future. But we also recognise that the NHS is under pressure right now. I am therefore exceptionally, and outside the spending review process, making an additional commitment of resource funding of £2.8 billion to the NHS in England, £350 million immediately to allow trusts to plan for this winter, £1.6 billion in 2018-19, with the balance in 1920, taking the extra resource into the NHS next year to £3.75 billion in total. Meaning, Mr Deputy Speaker, meaning that our NHS will receive a £7.5 billion increase to its resource budget over this year and next. Mr Deputy Speaker, our nation's nurses provide invaluable support to us all in our time of greatest need and deserve our deepest gratitude for their tireless efforts. My right hon. Friend the Health Secretary has already begun discussions with health unions on pay structure modernisation for Agenda for Change staff to improve recruitment and retention. He will submit evidence to the independent pay review body in due course. But I want to assure NHS staff and patients and members of this House that if the Health Secretary's talks bear fruit, I will protect patient services by providing additional funding for such a settlement. Mr Deputy Speaker, just as our public services must be fit for the future, so too must our tax system. It must remain competitive to attract the brightest and the best to establish and grow the businesses of the future. It must raise the revenue we need to fund our public services, and it must be robust against abuse so that it is fair to all. Now, we've heard a lot of talk recently from the party opposite about what they would do to crack down on tax avoidance and evasion. But the truth is, Mr Deputy Speaker, they didn't. It's this government that has clamped down on avoidance and evasion. This government that has seen the tax gap cut by a quarter since 2010 to a record low, and this government that has raked in an extra £160 billion over seven years for our public services by collecting the taxes that are due. So I'm going to take no lectures, but I will, but I will take action, Mr Deputy Speaker. And this budget continues the work of the last seven years with a further package of measures that is forecast to raise £4.8 billion by 2022-23, doing the job that Labour failed to do for 13 years in office. Mr Deputy Speaker, our long-term phased reduction of corporation tax has generated investment and jobs and raised £20 billion extra for our public services. We are committed to maintaining Britain's competitive corporation tax rates, but there is a case now for removing the anomaly of the indexation allowance for capital gains, bringing the corporate tax system into line with the personal capital gains tax system. I will therefore freeze this allowance so that companies receive relief for inflation up to January 2018, but not thereafter. I'm grateful to the Office for Tax Simplification for their recent report on the VAT registration threshold. At £85,000, the UK's VAT threshold is by far the highest in the OECD. By contrast, in Germany, it is just £15,600. 
I note the OTS conclusion that it distorts competition and disincentivises business growth. I also note the Federation of Small Businesses' concerns about the cliff edge of the threshold. But such a high threshold also has the benefit of keeping the majority of small businesses out of VAT altogether. So I am not minded to reduce the threshold. But I will consult on whether its design could better incentivise growth, and in the meantime we will maintain it at its current level of £85,000 for the next two years. Mr Deputy Speaker, we can't build an economy fit for the future without supporting its backbone, our 5.5 million small businesses, who are responsible between them for nearly half of our private sector jobs. They give our economy its extraordinary vibrancy and resilience. But I recognise that many are feeling under pressure right now. And I know that h- what hard work it is to get a business off the ground, to get it to grow. So today I want to do what we can to ease that pressure. Mr Deputy Speaker, business rates represent a high fixed cost for small businesses. At Budget 2016, we introduced a package of business rate relief worth almost £9 billion with a further £435 million in the spring budget. Today, I go further. We have listened to concerns about the potential costs of the annual uprating of business rates in April next year. And today, I will accept the representation of the British Chambers of Commerce, CBI and other business organisations and bring forward the planned switch from RPI to CPI by two years to April 2018. A move a move which is worth £2.3 billion to business over the next five years. I have also listened to businesses affected by the so-called staircase tax. We will change the law to ensure that where a business has been impacted by the Supreme Court ruling, it can have its original bill reinstated if it chooses and backdated. And I hope I, hope I can expect cross-party backing to speed that measure through Parliament. Mr Deputy Speaker, three simple steps to solve the staircase tax. To, well, what do they expect? It's the tax section. Yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, to support the thousands of small pubs that are at the heart of so many of our communities, we'll extend the £1,000 discount for pubs with a rateable value of less than £100,000 for one more year to March 2019. And I've heard the concerns about the five-yearly revaluation system. Shorter revaluation periods will reduce the size of changes in valuations. So I can announce today that after the next revaluation, future revaluations will take place every three years. This Conservative Government listening to small business. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a wider concern across this House and in the business community about the tax system in the digital age. Because along with innovation and growth that it brings, Digitalisation poses challenges for the sustainability and fairness of our tax system. But this challenge can only properly be solved on an international basis, and the UK is leading the charge in the OECD and the G20 to find solutions. Today we publish a position paper on the tax challenge posed by the digital economy, setting out our emerging thinking about potential solutions. But in the meantime, we will take what action we can. Multinational digital businesses pay billions of pounds in royalties to jurisdictions where they are not taxed, and some of these royalties relate to UK sales. So from April 2019, and in accordance with our international obligations, we will apply income tax to royalties relating to UK sales when those royalties are paid to a low-tax jurisdiction, even if they do not fall to be taxed in the UK under our current rules. Mr Deputy Speaker, this will raise about £200 million a year. It does not solve the problem, but it does send a signal of our determination, and we will continue to work in the international arena to find a sustainable and fair long-term solution that properly taxes the digital businesses that operate in our cyberspace. And following representations from a number of my honourable friends, we are also taking further action to address online VAT fraud, which costs the taxpayer £1.2 billion per year, by making all online marketplaces 
jointly liable with their sellers for VAT, ensuring that sellers operating through them pay the right amount of VAT, just as we would expect retailers on our high street to do. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to turn to the challenge of the housing market, but before I do, I want to touch on the aftermath of the appalling events at Grenfell Tower. We have provided financial support for the victims of this terrible tragedy, and today I can announce we will provide Kensington and Chelsea Council with a further £28 million for mental health and counselling services, regeneration support for the surrounding areas, and to provide a new community space for local residents. This tragedy should never have happened, and we must ensure that nothing like it ever happens again. All local authorities and housing associations must carry out any identified necessary safety works as soon as possible. And if any local authority cannot access funding to pay for essential fire safety work, they should contact us immediately. I have said before, and I will say again today, we will not allow financial constraints to get in the way of any essential fire safety work. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to also address the issue of empty properties. It cannot be right to leave property empty when so many are desperate for a place to live. So we will legislate to give local authorities the power to charge a 100 per cent council tax premium on empty properties. We will also launch a consultation on barriers to longer tenancies in the private rented sector and how we might encourage landlords to offer them to those tenants who want the extra security. I also want to say something about rough sleeping. It is unacceptable that in 21st century Britain there are people sleeping on the streets. So we will invest today £28 million in three new housing first pilots in the West Midlands, in Manchester and in Liverpool, and we will establish a homelessness task force as part of our commitment to halving rough sleeping by 2022 and eliminating it by 2027. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank the many colleagues who submitted ideas on how to tackle the challenge of the housing market, including uh, my honourable friends from North East Hampshire, Eastleigh and Western Supermare in particular. By continuing to invest in Britain's infrastructure, skills and R&D, we will ensure the recovery and productivity growth that is the key to delivering our vision of a stronger, fairer, more balanced economy and the assurance to the next generation of their economic security. But however successful we are in that endeavour, there is one area where young people today will rightly feel concern about their future prospects, and that is in the housing market. House prices are increasingly out of reach for many. It takes too long to save for a deposit, and rents absorb too high a portion of monthly income. So the number of 25 to 34-year-olds owning their own home has dropped from 59 per cent to just 38 per cent over the last 13 years. Put simply, successive governments over decades have failed to build enough homes to deliver the home-owning dream that this country has always been proud of, or indeed to meet the needs of those who rent. In Manchester a few weeks ago, my right honourable friend the Prime Minister made a pledge to Britain's younger generation that she would dedicate her premiership to fixing this problem, and today we take the next steps to delivering on that pledge by choosing to build. We send a message to the next generation that getting on the housing ladder is not just a dream of your parents' past, but a reality for your future. We have made a start with schemes like Help to Buy, which has helped over 320,000 people buy a home. We have increased the supply of homes. We have increased the supply of homes by more than 1.1 million since 2010 including nearly 350,000 affordable homes. House building stands at its highest level since the crash, with the latest figures showing that over 217,000 net additional homes were added to the stock last year. That is a remarkable achievement, but we need to do better still if we are to see affordability improve. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a complex challenge and there is no single magic bullet. If we don't 
If we don't increase the supply of land for new homes, more money will simply inflate prices and make matters worse. If we don't do more to support the growth of the SME house building sector that was all but wiped out by Labour's Great Recession, we will remain dependent on the major national house builders that dominate the industry. And if we don't train the construction workers of tomorrow, we may generate planning permissions, but we will not turn them into homes. So solving this challenge will require money, it will require planning reform, and it will require intervention. So today we set out an ambitious plan to tackle the housing challenge. Over the next five years, we will commit a total of at least £44 billion of capital funding, loans and guarantees to support our housing market, to boost the supply of skills, resources and building land, and to create the financial incentives necessary to deliver 300,000 net additional homes a year on average by the mid-2020s, the biggest annual increase in housing supply since 1970. New money for the Home Builders Fund to get SME house builders building again, a £630 million small sites fund to unstick the delivery of 40,000 homes, a further £2.7 billion to more than double the housing infrastructure fund, £400 million more for estate regeneration, a £1.1 billion fund to unlock strategic sites, including new settlements and urban regeneration schemes, a lifting of HRA caps for councils in high demand areas to get them building again, and £8 billion of new financial guarantees to support private house building and the purpose-built private rented sector. And because we need a workforce to build these new homes, we're providing an additional £34 million to develop construction skills across the country. Mr Deputy Speaker, solving the housing challenge takes more than money, it takes planning reform. We will focus on the urban areas where people want to live and where most jobs are created, making best use of our urban land and continuing the strong protection of our green belt. In particular, building high quality, high density homes in city centres and around major transport hubs. And to put the needs of our young people first, we will ensure that councils in high demand areas permit more homes for local first time buyers and affordable renters. My right honourable friend, the Community Secretary, will set out more detail in a statement to the House in due course. However, one thing is very clear. There is a significant gap between the number of planning permissions granted and the number of homes built. In London alone, there are 270,000 residential planning permissions unbuilt. We need to understand why, Mr Deputy Speaker. So I am establishing an urgent review to look at the gap between planning permissions and housing starts. It will be chaired by my right honourable friend, the member for West Dorset, and will deliver an interim report and will deliver an interim report in time for the spring statement next year. And if that report finds that vitally needed land is being withheld from the market for commercial rather than technical reasons, We will intervene to change the incentives to ensure such land is brought forward for development using direct intervention, compulsory purchase powers as necessary. Mr Deputy Speaker, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has said we will fix this problem, and no one should doubt the Government's determination to do so. But the solution will not deliver itself. Local authorities will need help and support. Developers will need encouragement and persuasion. Infrastructure to facilitate higher density development must be funded and delivered. So the Homes and Communities Agency will expand to become Homes England, bringing together money, expertise and planning and compulsory purchase powers with a clear remit to facilitate delivery of sufficient new homes where they are most needed to deliver a sustained improvement in housing affordability. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the battle to achieve and sustain affordability will be a long-term one. 
So we also need to look beyond this Parliament to long-term measures. We will use new town development corporations to kick-start five new locally agreed garden towns in areas of demand pressure, delivered through public-private partnerships designed to attract long-term capital investment from around the world. Last week, the National Infrastructure Commission published their report on the Cambridge Milton Keynes Oxford Corridor. Today, we back their vision and commit to building up to a million homes by 2050, completing the road and rail infrastructure to support them. And as a down payment on this plan, we have agreed an ambitious housing deal with Oxfordshire to deliver 100,000 homes by 2031, capitalising on the global reputations of our two most famous universities and Britain's biggest new town to create a dynamic new growth corridor for the 21st century. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is our plan to deliver on the pledge we have made to the next generation, that the dream of home ownership will become a reality in this country once again. But I also want to take action today to help young people who are saving to own a home. One of the biggest challenges facing young first-time buyers is the cash required up front. We have put £10 billion more money in to help to buy equity loan to help those saving for a deposit. But I want to do more still. I have received representations for a temporary stamp duty holiday to first-time buyers, but this would only help those who are ready to purchase now and would offer nothing for the many who will need to save for years. So, with effect from today, for all first time buyer purchases up to £300,000, I am abolishing stamp duty altogether. have to let the Chancellor finish. <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, to ensure that this relief also helps first-time buyers in very high price areas like London, it will also be available on the first £300,000 of the purchase price of properties up to £500,000, meaning, meaning an effective reduction of £5,000. Mr Deputy Speaker, that is a stamp duty cut for 95 per cent of all first-time buyers who pay stamp duty and no stamp duty at all for 80 per cent of first-time buyers from today. Mr Deputy Speaker, when we say we will revive the home-owning dream in Britain, we mean it. We do not underestimate the scale of the challenge, but today we have made a substantial down payment. Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the things that I love most about this country is its sense of opportunity. I have always felt it, and I want young people growing up today to have that same sense of boundless opportunity. In this budget, I have set out a vision for Britain's future and a plan for delivering it. But by getting our debt down, by supporting British families and businesses, by investing in the technologies and the skills of the future, by creating the homes and the infrastructure our country needs, we are at a turning point in our history, and we resolve to look forwards, not backwards, to build on the strengths of the British economy, to embrace change, not hide from it, to seize the opportunities ahead of us, and together to build a Britain fit for the future. I commend this statement. Order number 51, the first motion entitled Provisional Collection of Taxes, must be decided without debate. Will the Chancellor of the Exchequer please move formally? Formally. formally. 
The question is that, pursuant to Section 5 of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968, provisional statutory effects shall be given to the following motions. Stamp duty land tax, higher rates for additional dwellings, motion number 35. Stamp duty land tax relief for the first time buyers, motion number 36. Tobacco products duties, rates, rates motion number 40. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I, Ronnie, order, order, order. I now call upon the Chancellor of the Exchequer to move the motion entitled Income Tax. It is on the motion that the debate will take place today and succeeding days. The questions on this motion and on the remo remaining motions will be put at the end of the budget debate <coughs> on Tuesday, the 28th of November. Minister to move. Move formally. The income tax is charged for the tax years 2018-19, and it is declared that the expedient and in the public interest of the resolution should have statutory effect under the provisions of the Provisional Collection of Taxes Act 1968. I now call the Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The test of a budget is how it affects the reality of people's lives all around this country. And I would submit, Mr. Speaker, that the reality. Luke, let's. If somebody wants to go for an early cup of tea, please do so. I'm told there's mince pies are waiting. But what I will have is the Leader of the Opposition listen to and quietly from this side, in the same way I expected the other side, the other side of the House. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The reality test of this budget has to be how it affects ordinary people's lives. And I believe as the days go ahead and this budget unravels, the reality will be a lot of people will be no better off and the misery, misery that many are in will be continuing. Pay, Mr Speaker, is now Pay, Mr. Speaker, is now lower than it was in 2010, and wages are now falling again. Economic growth in the first three quarters of this year is the lowest since 2009 and the slowest of the major economies in the G7. It is a record of failure, with a forecast of more to come. Economic growth has been revised down. Productivity growth has been revised down, business investment revised down, people's wages and living standards revised down. What sort of strong economy is that? What sort of fit for the future is that? You may report, recall, Mr Deputy Speaker, the deficit was due to be eradicated by 2015. Then, that moved to 2016, then to 2017, then 2020, and now we're looking at 2025. <laughs> They're missing their major targets, but the failed and damaging policy of austerity remains. The number of people sleeping rough has doubled since 2010. And this Christmas, this Christmas, Mr Deputy Speaker, 120,000 children will spend Christmas in temporary accommodation. Three new pilot schemes to look at rough sleeping across the whole country simply doesn't cut it. We want action now to help those poor people that are forced to sleep on our streets and beg for the money. Order, 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 order. Order. I think the whip should know better. Mr Spencer, I'm sure we can relax. If not, please. We don't need any more from you. If not, leave the chamber. Jeremy Cobb. The point I was making, Mr Speaker, three new pilot schemes for rough sleepers simply doesn't cut it. It is a disaster for those people sleeping on our streets, forced to beg for the money for a night shelter. They're looking for action now. 
from government to give them a roof over their heads. In some parts of the country, Mr Speaker, life expectancy is actually beginning to fall. The last Labour government lifted one million children out of poverty. It was an amazing achievement. Under this government, an extra one million children will be plunged into poverty by the end of this Parliament. 1.9 million pensioners, one in six of all pensioners, are living in poverty, the worst rate anywhere in Western Europe. So it's falling pay, slow growth and rising poverty, and this is what the Chancellor has the cheek to call a strong economy. His predecessors said they would put the burden on those with the broadest shoulders. So how's that turned out? The poorest, the poorest tenth, Mr. Speaker, the, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the poorest tenth of households will lose 10% of their income by 2022, while the richest, while the richest will lose just 1%. So much for tackling burning injustices. This is a government tossing fuel on the fire. Personal debt levels are rising. 8.3 million people over indebted. If he wants to help people out of debt, he should back Labour's policy for a real living wage, a real living wage of £10 an hour by 2020. Working class young people now leaving university with £57,000 worth of debt because this government, his government, trebled tuition fees and the new government policy is to win over young people by keeping fees at 9,250 per year. More debt for people who want to learn. But that is just one of the multitudes of injustices presiding over this government. Another is universal credit, which we called on the ministers to pause and fix. That's the view of this House. It's the verdict of those on the front line. Or, 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 or. Mr Pincher. To shout out, keep going, he will. But you'll be going out to the chamber. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. I would rather people stay to listen, actually, Mr Deputy yeah. Speaker. To the reality. Silence! That's the difference. Right now. Mr. Hall. It will be in silence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Maybe the Menches opposite would like to listen to Martin's experience. A full-time a full-time worker on a minimum wage. He said, I get paid four weekly, meaning that my pay date is different each month. And because of the under the universal credit system, he was paid twice in a month and deemed to have earned too much, his universal credit was cut off. This led me into rent arrears, and I had to use a food bank for the first time in my life. That is the humiliation that he and so many others have gone through because of the problems of universal credit. Wouldn't it have been better to pause the whole thing and look at the problems it has caused? The Chancellor's solution to a failing system causing more debt is to offer a loan and the six-week wait, with 20 per cent waiting even longer, simply becomes a five-week wait. This system has been run down by three billion pounds of cuts to work allowances, the two-child limit and the perverse and appalling rape clause, and caused evictions because housing benefit isn't paid direct to the landlord. So I say to the Chancellor again, put this system on hold so it can be fixed and keep one million of our children out of poverty. For years, We've had the rhetoric of, Mr Spe Deputy Speaker, a long-term economic plan that never meets its targets. When, it, when what all too many are experiencing is long-term economic pain. And hardest hit are disabled people, single parents and women. So it's 
disappointing the Chancellor did not back the campaign by my honourable friend, the member for Brent Central, to end period poverty. He could have done that. Well done her on the campaign. Shame on him for not supporting it. The Conservative manifesto in the last election disappeared off its website after three days, and now some ministers opposite have put forward some half-decent proposals, conspicuously borrowed by the Labour manif- from the Labour manifesto. Let me tell the Chancellor, Mr Speaker, as socialists, we are happy to share ideas. The Community Secretary called £50 billion of borrowing to invest in house building. Presumably, the Prime Minister slapped him down for wanting to bankrupt Britain. The Health Secretary said the pay cap is over, but where is the money to fund the pay rise? The Chancellor has not been clear today. Not for NHS workers, our police, firefighters, teachers, teaching assistants, bin collectors, tax collectors or armed forces personnel. So will the Chancellor listen to Claire, who says her mum works for the NHS? She goes above and beyond for her, for her patients. Why does the government think it's OK to underpay, overstress and underappreciate all those that work within our NHS? The NHS Chief Executive says the budget for the NHS next year is well short of what is currently needed. And from what the Chancellor has said today, it's still going to be well short of what is needed. He said in 2015 they would fund another 5,000 GPs, but in the last year, 1,200. We've had 1,200 fewer GPs, and we've lost community nurses and mental health nurses. The Chancellor promised 10 billion in 2015 and delivered 4.5. So, if you don't mind, we'll wait for the small print on today's announcement. But even what he said certainly falls well short of the six billion Labour would have delivered from our June manifesto. Over a million of our elderly aren't receiving the the care they need. Over six billion. Over six billion will have been cut from social care budgets by next March. I hope the honourable member begins to understand what it's like to wait for social care stuck in a hospital bed or other people having to give up their work to care for them. The uncaring, the uncaring, uncouth attitude of certain members of to be called out. Order. Order. Mr Speaker, that is, that is why social care budgets are so important for so many very desperate people in our country. Our schools, Mr Deputy Speaker, will be 5% worse off by 2019 despite the Conservative manifesto promising no school would be worse off. 5,000 head teachers from 25 counties wrote to the Chancellor saying we are simply asking for the money that has been taken out of the system to be returned. A senior science technician wrote to me, Robert, saying my pay has, may, my pay has been reduced by over 30%. I've seen massive cuts at my school. Good teachers and support staff leave. That is what does for the morale of both teachers and students in school. According to this government, 5,000 head teachers are wrong, Robert is wrong, the IFS is wrong, everybody is wrong except the Chancellor. And, And if the Chancellor bothered to listen to what local government is saying, They have been warning that services for the most vulnerable children are under more demand than ever. More children being taken into care, more in desperate need of help and support. Yet they're labouring with a two billion shortfall in in the cost of dealing with vulnerable children. Because local councils have lost 80% will have lost 80% of their direct funding by 2020. And the reality of this, 
Mr. Speaker, across the country is women's refuges closing, youth centres closing, libraries closing, museums closing, public facilities understaffed, under resourced, and underfinanced. It could be so different. But, Mr. Speaker, compassion can cost very little. Just £10 million is needed to establish the Child Funeral Fund campaign for so brilliantly by my honourable friend, the member for Swansea East. Why couldn't the Chancellor have at least agreed to fund that? Under this Government, there are also 20,000 fewer police officers and another 6,000 community support officers and 11,000 fire service staff have been cut as well. You cannot keep communities safe on the cheap. Tammy explains this. Our police presence has been taken away from her village, meaning increasing crime. As a single parent, I no longer feel safe in the village where I live, particularly at night. Mr Speaker, five and a half million workers earn less than the living wage, a million more than five years ago. And the Chancellor last Sunday couldn't even see 1.4 million people unemployed in this country. There is a crisis of low pay and insecure work affecting one in four women and one in six men. A record 7.4 million people in working households living in poverty. If we want workers earning better pay, less dependent on in-work benefits, we need strong trade unions, we need the most effective way of boosting workers' pay. Instead, this Government weakened trade unions and in, in, introduced employment tribunal fees, now scrapped thanks to the victory in the courts by Unison, a trade union representing its members. And Mr Deputy Speaker, why didn't the Chancellor take the opportunity to make two changes to control debt? Firstly, to cap credit card debt so that nobody pays back more than they borrowed. And secondly, to stop credit card companies increasing people's credit limit without their say-so. Debt is being racked up because the government is weak on those who exploit people, such as rail companies hiking up fares above inflation year on year, and water companies and energy suppliers. During the general election, it promised an energy cap that would benefit around 17 million families on standard variable tariffs. But every bill tells millions of families the Government has broken that promise. And with £10 billion in housing benefit going into the pockets of private landlords every year, housing is a key factor in driving up the welfare bill. Not too many words from the Chancellor about the excessive levels of rent in the private rented sector. With this Government delivering the worst rate of house building since the 1920s and a quarter... And a quarter, a quarter of a million fewer council homes, any commitment would be welcome. But we've been here before. The government promised 200,000 starter homes three years ago. Not a single one has yet been built in those three years. We need a large scale, publicly funded house building programme not this Government's accounting tricks and empty promises. Yes, we back the abolition of stamp duty of first-time buyers because it was another Labour policy in our manifesto in June, not a Tory one. And this Government continues preference for spin over substance. That means across this country the words Northern Powerhouse and Midlands Engine are now met with derision. Yorkshire and Humber get only one-tenth of the transport investment per head given to London. And government figures show that every region in the north of England, every region in the north of England has seen a fall in spending on services since 2012. The Midlands, East and West is receiving less than 8% of total transport infrastructure investment, compared with 50% going to London. In the East and West Midlands, one in four workers are paid less than the living wage. So much for the Midlands engine. 
re-announced funding for the Trans-Pennine Rail Route won't cut it, and today's other announcements won't redress that balance. Combined with counterproductive austerity, this lack of investment has consequences in sluggish growth and shrinking pay packets. Public investment has virtually halved. Under this government, Britain has the lowest rate of public investment in the G7. But it's now investing in driverless cars after months of road testing backseat driving in the government. <laughs> by, moving, That's how you tell them. <laughs> by moving from RPI to CPI indexation on business rates, the Chancellor has adopted another Labour policy. But why don't they go further and adopt Labour's, Labour's entire business rates pledge, including exempting plant and machinery and annual revaluation of business rates? Nowhere has their chaos been more evident than over Brexit. Following round after round of fruitless Brexit negotiations, the Brexit Secretary has been shunted out for the Prime Minister, who has got no further. Every major business organisation has written to the government telling them to pull their finger out and get on with it. Businesses are delaying crucial investment decisions because if this government doesn't get its act together soon, they will be taking relocation decisions. Crashing out with no deal and turning Britain into a tax haven will damage people's jobs and living standards, serving only a wealthy few. It's not as if this government isn't doing its best to protect tax havens and their clients in the meantime. The Paradise Papers have again exposed how a super-rich elite is allowed to get away with dodging taxes. This government has opposed measure after measure in this House and their Tory colleagues in the European Parliament to clamp down on the tax havens that facilitate this outrageous leeching of from our public purse. Non-paid tax, clever reinvestment to get away with tax, actually hits hospitals, schools, housing, and hits the poorest and most needy in our society. There's nothing moral about dodging tax. There's everything immoral about evading it. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, too often, too often it feels like there is one rule for the super-rich and another for the rest of us. The horrors of Grenfell Tower were a reflection of a system that puts profits before people, that fails to listen to working class communities. In 2013, the government received advice in a coroner's report that sprinklers should be fitted in all high rise buildings. Today, once again, the government failed to fund the £1 billion investment needed. The Chancellor says. The, co the councils should contact them. But Nottingham has, Westminster has, and they've been refused. Nothing was offered to them. We, Mr Speaker, have the privilege to be members of Parliament in a building that is about to be retrofitted with sprinklers to protect us. The message is pretty clear. This government cares more about what happens here than happens to people living in high-rise homes, in effect saying they matter less. Our country, Mr Speaker, is marked by growing inequality and injustice. We were promised uh, with lots of hype a revolutionary budget. The reality is nothing has changed. People were looking for help from this budget and they've been let down let down by a government that, like the economy they presided over, is weak and unstable and in need of urgent change. They call this a budget fit for the future. The reality is this is a government no longer fit for office. Nicky yeah. Morgan. Very much sense at last. Mr Deputy Speaker, for uh, calling me to take part in this debate for the first time as Chair of the Treasury Select Committee. Now, if media reports are to be believed, I'm not... So that was the budget.
hotly more than we expected. And actually, there was a little bit more in there, wasn't there, than we expected. There was a little bit to get our teeth into. But probably the most shocking thing that we've all taken away from it was the OBR's forecast. They've massively downgraded growth that we was, it's going to happen over the next few years, which perhaps has limited what Philip Hammond can do. Yes, I mean, to me, that was the big story because the OBR has downgraded uh, growth to around 1.5% effectively for the next four or five years. And if it turns out to be the case that that is the growth, mm. um, uh, that'll be the longest period of such low growth, I think, that I can ever recall, actually, in living memory, certainly of, as far as official forecasters have played it. So, mm -hmm. and that's a, you know, that's a really deeply depressing outlook that they've painted for us. And it's all down to the fact that they've they've uh, considerably downgraded their forecast for productivity growth. Now, uh, the interesting thing here is that um, ever since the OBR was set up um, six or seven years ago, they've assumed that productivity after the financial crisis would return to mm -hmm. pre-crisis yeah. trend very quickly. And they've spent sort of six or seven years sort of saying, next year, next year, next year, and it hasn't happened. So finally, they've given way and they've said, well, maybe that's the new trend. But I suspect that it, uh, they, they've changed their minds just at the point when productivity begins to surge back through. So I think they're being far too yeah. pessimistic. And Philip Hammond was keen to say that borrowing is, is going to go down, but we all know there's going to be a deficit for a number more years. So the thing that's really going to grab the headlines is, of course, those OBR figures. But there were there was some good news to some people on the surface, it would seem. So stamp duty was the thing that really stuck out that I think got the biggest applause from MPs in the House. But we were talking about how maybe actually it might not raise as much money, perhaps, as the, the big announcement would suggest. It feels like good news to the individual person, but how much money it will actually raise for the government. So I think you know it, it's, it's the stamp duty announcement is certainly good news for lots of people who are about to get on the property ladder. It means a, a nice tax break. So somebody who was going to buy a five hundred thousand pound house would save five thousand um, pounds, which is not to be sniffed at. Um, and I've got the figures on here. The three th around the three hundred thousand mark. It was a similar amount, I think. Um, so that is really good. Um, but not everybody will benefit from this. And it, 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 it's very interesting how they had a cap on the amount. Um, you can see why they've done that. They obviously don't want people sort of buying big mansions in their children's name just to get the tax break. Mm -hmm. Sensible. But you do wonder whether it might distort the market around that value, especially in London. Um, what can you actually get for £500,000? Well, you can get a flat, but not a lot else. Um, so interesting. Yeah, and we were talking about how and it's actually. not worth that much money, is it really? Or is it? It's worth about five 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 thousand pounds to somebody buying at that top, the top no, of the threshold, um, which is really not to be sneezed at. But when you consider the actual size of the deposit that they would need mm. to have that in the first place, it feels more like a bonus than um, something that's really going to put somebody yeah. in a very drastically dis different situation to what they were in before the budget. Yeah. And we were talking about, you know, when it actually comes to selling your home, if it had been valued at five fifteen, you might have to put it down to four nine five yes. to encourage people to come and buy it because. You think you'd make a little tax break yes, if you so were if to buy it. if you're a seller of one of those exactly. homes, you're probably going to be panicking a bit because you're not going to want to sell your house at 510, yep. for example. You're going to want to do it at 499, uh, you know, which is not good for sellers. But arguably, they may have had a uh, very healthy growth uh, in their property price over the past few years. So, uh, you know, possibly not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. and obviously it was targeted, I think, at young people. Mm. But as we were saying in London, it, it, 500,000 isn't as much as it will be in the rest of the country, but it is perhaps good for young people yeah. I mean, it's, in the rest of the country. Exactly. And it's important that you know, th th this stamp duty thing is, is, is going to be benefiting the people who are in the fortunate position to be buying a house. What there was for the masses, the young masses, was the rail card, <laughs> which I guess some, you know, I've seen some quite interesting comments about that just being a bit of a sticking plaster because what it really signifies is that this younger generation can't afford to live as adults, which is an incredibly worrying idea. Yeah, I think the yeah. rail card saves a young person on average £150 a year, yeah. which is all right. <laughs> not to be seen start, but... No, thank you, but <laughs> maybe not quite enough to convince you to vote Conservative, perhaps. Yes. Do you feel as though there were a few things in there were aimed at taking young people away from Jeremy Corbyn? Did it feel at all as though Philip Hammond was aware of the popularity of the Labour Party during the election, that they, he tried, you know, on issues such as 
welfare. We had some new reforms that were more generous than I expected mm. on universal credit, for example. A bit more money into the NHS, not as much as Simon Stevens would have liked, but a little bit more there. The rail card, talking about building more houses. Do you think there would be enough in what Philip Hammond has said this afternoon to convince a young person to move over? Well, well, the, the problem is that you can't really out Corbyn Corbyn on this kind of stuff because he's in opposition, he's able to say, promise, be all things to all men, you know, and promise the world mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, a big headline thing like no more tuition fees, um, we'll pay off all your student debt. You know, the, uh, a, a party which mm. is in government can never do that kind of stuff. I mean, there was a little, you know, there was, there, there was stuff around the edges uh, for young people, I, I thought. But the overall, my overall impression was that he started well and he pushed a lot of the buttons that people have been criticising him for. You know, he was a lot more hopeful. He said there are opportunities in Brexit and so on and so forth. So, so he started on a very positive note. And then there were lots of sort of itsy bitsy, sort of tiny little things, a whole series of really quite arcane announcements and you were left with a sort of impression of, of uh, the substance falling quite a long way short mm. of the rhetoric and there was nothing really, um, or despite um, his commitment to do something about productivity, there was nothing really to address this problem of very low growth forecasts going forward. You would have thought he'd look at those growth forecasts and mm. say, well, that's what the situation looks like at the moment, but I am going to change this. And he didn't really say that. Yeah. And we're going to change that outlook fundamentally. I, I did feel as well that some of the uh, promises were you know, so far in the future that they were almost mm. ridiculous. Mm. I mean, there was the, we discussed earlier, wasn't there, there was the uh, thing about the building one million houses by, what, 50, 2050? Yes, in, in I mean, the Oxford, we'll be dead then, um, won't we? Oxford, so. Cambridge, Milton Keynes <laughs> corridor. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's just well, you, you know, won't be dead. I might be. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be dead. <laughs> I mean, it just felt a bit too far in the future to even get excited about it yes. remotely to me. Um, anyway, so yeah. you know, I, I, I felt like it didn't. You know, if you're looking at mm -hmm. it, if it, especially for the younger audience who I know they were trying to appeal to, was it enough to inspire and, as you say, to shift? you know, possibly yeah. for a Corbyn voter over. I don't think so. But it's interesting because who was Philip Hammond trying to appease with this budget? There was a lot of criticism of mm. him leading up to it today. We talked about that earlier, what this meant politically for him and his position. There are a few things in there where he announced and I thought, ding, okay, that's appeased that yeah. group of Tory MPs, ding, mm. that's appeased that group of Tory MPs. And actually perhaps the Treasury's sort of motive in this was to keep Tory MPs at bay and actually not to commit too much news. It was just mm. to avoid some sort of blunder. Yeah. And it did feel <clears throat> blunder free. Of course, everyone's going to mm. go away now and analyse every one of these policies. I think he even <clears throat> said as well, didn't he? You know, he sent a little message to the headline writers, yeah. as he called them, to, you know, not talk about the white man in the van, that yeah. kind of thing. You know, he clearly doesn't want negative headlines tomorrow. Um, so I feel like he yeah. has sort of done his best in this budget to firefight that and preempt as much of that as possible yeah. to try and play it safe. And that was on tax hikes for owners of old um, diesel cars next yes. year. Yes, so, so that's going to be, I think, one where the detail is going to be very interesting to be looking mm. at this afternoon to see just how bad that might be for diesel owners. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of diesel owners um, b bought those cars because they were told at the time it was the right thing to do. Um, so they're not going to be very happy. <laughs> well, exactly. it, they're not going to be very happy if, it, uh, if, if they are, you know, really, really overtaxed and, it, and they become yeah. much financially worse off as a result of having that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested. It'll be one of the things I'm looking at. So you have one of those cars. I, I do. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, going back, I mean, Hammond, there were far too many jokes for his own good. I mean, he, that was, he, 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 <laughs> he had a low funny, load yeah. of jokes in his first budget. <laughs> and uh, and he, had, he said to me actually after that, oh, I'm, you know, I probably overdid it with the jokes, but he hasn't learned his <laughs> lesson. If he thought he'd overdone it, and there must yeah. have been about 20 jokes in there. Some were better than others. Uh, but there was quite a good moment he had of, of fun because, um, you know, it was relatively um, a gaff or uh, free, you know, there were no obvious howlers like there was in, were in his, his first budget. Um, but he's kind of led us all into thinking, 
oh, he's going to do something really stupid when, <laughs> when, when he started to talk about, you know, the, the, the um, threshold for mm -hmm. small businesses paying VAT. And there's been a lot of speculation, Katie has written about it, about them whacking down this threshold, yeah. which would force a, a lot of small businesses to p pay VAT. Mm -hmm. And we thought, oh my God, he's going to do it. Oh my goodness. And then he didn't. Uh, so he had yeah, a bit yeah, of really fun yeah, so with when, us. When he brought <laughs> that up, I was thinking, oh my God, here we go. But, yeah. he, did, but he didn't. But he did exactly. look into it, didn't he? So I do wonder, you know, without moving the threshold, exactly yeah. what he would do. Yes. But, yeah. um, well, he's sort of played it off into the long grass, that one. Yeah, I mean, that, that would have been very controversial, wouldn't it? Yes. Um, it, you know, we would Definitely, have seen yeah, would have, huge changes yes. as a result and, of that. So. And a lot and of Tory MPs would have been very unhappy with that. that exactly. One of the big so, issues they were pressuring him on. So he avoided bear, obvious bear traps, you know, and we can say that about it. And, and on housing, do you think that there was enough in there to pacify the likes of Sajid Javid? No, I doubt it. Mm. Um, I mean, I don't know where he got this number from, uh, 44 billion, wasn't it, over so many, 10 years, was it? Something like that. Mm. <clears throat> and um, he's just rounded up a lot of numbers and stuck them all together, I suppose, and come up with a number which is not so far off what Sajid Javid um, was um, airing a few weeks ago. Mm. Um, but, oh, it's not. Is it going to solve the, 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 um, this broken housing market that Theresa May uh, talks about it doesn't seem to me that it's enough mm. and also you know her other promises about wanting to do something for the jams the just about managing yeah. and um, you know the, the left behinds and all that it didn't apart from the universal credit announcement which was obviously a good thing you know and, and yeah. about time really that they address this problem there wasn't really a lot in it. Uh, there's the living wage thing, but we we knew about that already. Yeah. The minimum wage thing. The, you know, tax, I mean, yeah. the tax income threshold has been slightly raised. Yeah, slightly. not dramatically. Yeah, yeah. But slightly, it's a small. People gesture. don't seem to get very excited about that. Yeah. Uh, people barely notice it, really. Um, just an interesting tweet here. Somebody said. Uh, on the stamp duty uh, changes, I do hope this extends to the parallel universe in which I can afford to contemplate home ownership. Mm. So I think there will be a lot of people feeling that. Yeah. yeah. I think, do you think that was meant to be the white rabbit of today's budget, that announcement on stamp duty? I suppose so, but it had been quite well trailed. It was, a, it was not yeah. exactly a surprise yeah. rabbit. Not a surprise. Not because, a surprise. He, you know, we knew he was going to try and do something yeah. on stamp mm -hmm. duty for first-time buyers, so and he, this is what he's done, so we didn't know the details. I, I do wonder if it will be picked apart now, this mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, yeah, I, well, overall impression, you know, he, he avoided, he avoided big mistakes. Mm. Um, the, the rhetoric wasn't bad, but the substance was a bit, little bit lacking, yeah. uh, mm. I think, and certainly not enough really to make a significant difference to the economy. Yeah, I mean, he talked about a, an urgent review into p bits of land around the country that have been granted planning permission yes. to build houses on but that haven't been built on yet. He was accused, his own, and a company that he helped found was accused of doing this exact thing this morning. Mm. Interesting timing there. And he also said, you know, that the Conservatives were committed to abolishing homelessness by 2027, I think. Um, and also he talked about 100% council tax on empty homes. But we were talking about, again, yes. what, what's the detail of that? What constitutes as an empty home? Also, how would it be enforced? It'll be very mm. interesting to see the detail yeah. on it. For example, in Kensington and Chelsea, where we know there are a lot of empty homes, um, actually, the count, you know, council tax rates are relatively low, um, yeah. especially for those m enormous properties where presumably the owners are incredibly wealthy. Um, so, you know, how will they enforce that mm -hmm. they pay the amount? Um, and also, is the amount equivalent to possibly having somebody there just looking after the property in order to not pay the tax? Mm. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see whether that really has any difference. Yeah, and I, I suppose for a government which is l looking to try and kind of renew itself and get back on mm. the, the front foot, this, this really didn't do it, I, I, was my, mm. my view. I mean, not everyone is going to agree with the way Trump has, um, <coughs> has set about his own particular uh, agenda. But at least there's a there's a narrative there that mm. we are going to improve the growth rate to three yeah. percent. We're going to do it through tax cuts and we're going to do it through deregulation and so on and so forth. And you didn't really get that kind of impression from what Hammond uh, said this morning. There's a lot of, as I say, itsy bitsy mm. stuff. Um, I wish uh, I must say I personally wish the 
governments would, British governments would uh, abandon these big set pieces of annual budgets. You know, they're a bit of a, a sort of drama, aren't they? Yeah. And no, no other advanced economy does it in quite <laughs> the same way. And, uh, you know, you, he is obliged to pull some kind of rabbit out of the hat every time. There wasn't one this time, but, um, you know. Yeah. Um, why do they do it? Why do they, it does feel like quite a farce because you hear one yeah. thing and yeah. then the next day you're hearing almost the complete opposite sometimes yes, it fails. Yes. So you just don't know, you know, if you're just a, somebody yeah. at home watching on the TV, you yeah. don't know what's going on, do you? And, and who can blame you? It's so confusing. Yes. Yeah. On that jolly note, <laughs> thanks guys for downplaying our budget analysis. <laughs> um, we'll be back next week for PMQs again. Thank you very much for watching.